live from the Julia Morgan Ballroom in San Francisco. Extracting the signal from the noise, it's the Cube, covering Structure 2015. Now your host, George Gilbert. This is George Gilbert. We're uh, at Structure 2015, uh, reborn uh, and, and really healthy from uh, our uh, the old Gigam. And uh, we're pleased to welcome um, Alex Polvey from CoreOS. Uh, everyone seems to want to talk to Alex these days. <laughs> so we've got first dib. <laughs> Alex, why don't you tell us a, a little bit about uh, CoreOS and um, why it's uh, of such relevance right now? Sure. So we started CoreOS a little over two years ago, about two and a half years ago now. Uh, and our mission is to fundamentally improve the security of the internet. And our approach in doing that is to help companies run infrastructure in this, this way um, that, that allows it to be much more serviceable and have much better security and so on. This way that we're modeling looks a lot like what we've seen from the hyperscale companies, folks like Google. So we, we often call it Google's infrastructure for everyone else, Giphy for short, because that's kind of a mouthful. Okay. And that involves distributed systems, containers, um, and running on standard hardware, which in 2015 can be a bare metal server or it can be an instance in AWS. Okay, so um, help us understand though that if core OS, it sounds like there's an operating system at the core. Yeah. Um, is this like a cut down version of Linux that gives it a small attack surface and uh, sort of easier deployment and, and patching? Is that? Exactly. So, so in our quest to run the world servers to secure the internet, we start at the lowest level components possible. Um, there's the OS, and then there's the distributed system side. So CoreOS um, is our company name, but it's also the name of the first product that we released, CoreOS Linux. Okay. CoreOS Linux is a lightweight container-based OS um, that automatically updates itself, because we think that updates are the key to good security. And so it's a combination of the updates, the container weight, the lightweight container-based sort of application model, as well as just stripping everything else out. I mean, the last 20 years of Linux distributions have created lots of corrupt, so it was time to kind of re reborn, you know, re rebirth a, a, new, uh, a new lightweight Linux OS. In uh, sticking to CoreOS for a moment, yeah. in an earlier era, might we have called this like an embedded OS where you, you just sort of chopped out everything that was not necessary for the application? Yeah, that one app? it's very much inspired by embedded OSs. Um, on servers, you know, you really want to get everything out of the way of the resources, like the memory and CPU and so on, so you right. get as much as you want out of it. So while it's a little bit counterintuitive, you have this really monster server, um, you still want as light and thin of an OS in there as you possibly can, like an embedded OS, so you can really maximize the performance. So something that abstracts the hardware but gets out of the way. Exactly. Just focus, get on the things that matter, which is running your applications and managing the actual hardware and really nothing else. Okay, so presumably to provide Google's infrastructure for everyone else, and I don't remember the acronym Giphy. for that. Giphy. <laughs> okay. What, what other products did you have to fill out you know, to make that possible? Sure, great question. So the next major piece that we released is a tool called etcd. It's uh, meant for doing shared configuration among servers. Whenever you have a group of servers, the first thing you need to do is they all need to know about each other and, and tell each other about the configuration. This is load balancers knowing where the app servers are, the app servers knowing where the databases are, and so on. And to do this in the most robust distributed systems way, um, you have to do this thing in computer science that's very difficult called consensus. Okay, consensus algorithms is an area of computing, actually speaking about here a little bit with Eric Brewer, who is a, a, um, a huge academic, a very well-respected engineer in the area of consensus and distributed systems. And so we built etcd, which solves this really hard distributed systems problem in a way that's usable by, by many operations teams. Um, so let me just interrupt you for a sec. Yeah. I mean, I, I've got this sound going off in my head that says zookeeper, zookeeper. Exactly. Okay. It's, it's zookeeper for everyone else. <laughs> zookeeper is really to simplify to simplify zookeeper and make it accessible. Our, our theory is that a lot of people wanted to use distributed systems, but zookeeper is a little bit too difficult to use as well. It's really oriented towards the Java and Hadoop community, and there's a whole wide array of uh, other folks out there. So it couldn't make as many constraining assumptions as yours, which would simplify 
It just couldn't be as widely as ado adopted. Um, and so we released etcd okay. around the same time we released CoreOS Linux. And at this point, there's been over 1,000 projects, if you go on GitHub, that have built things around etcd. So our, our bet was right. Even things like Kubernetes itself has a hard dependency on etcd. Without etcd, Kubernetes wow. will not run. Um, okay. So it, our hypothesis there was let's make the hardest parts of distributed systems easier, uh -huh. and then we will see distributed systems overall accelerate. And that is definitely what's happened with etcd. OK, so help us understand how you've built up the rest of the infrastructure and then where you'd like to see it go. Sure, so the, the thing that we're targeting is, is this distributed systems approach. And again, we care about this a lot because we think that the ability to manage and service your applications is what is the key to the security, keeping things up to date. And when we mean up to date, we don't just mean like patch of vulnerability, of which we fixed many of those, but it's also about a company's comfort rolling out a new version of their application that they won't break something. And if you run your infrastructure in a distributed system, you can roll out a version. If it breaks a little bit of the application, that's okay, but you didn't take the whole thing down. And that's the kind of the safety net that distributed systems gives you. Is so, this, does this require the sort of microservice approach where you know there's a clean separation between this new bit, this new set of bits and the rest of the app? It, it, it really does. Um, and that's why we've invested so heavily in containers. Um, you know, it requires the container. It also requires the distributed systems components of it. So we built first built CoreOS Linux, then we built etcd, and then we started building um, some distributed systems work very early in the market. Um, and then things like Kubernetes came along, and we were like, hey, Instead of us going and reinventing all this stuff, let's partner up with the guys from Google, if we're monitoring Google's infrastructure for everyone else, right. let's partner up with the team at Google that built that and get their solution more widely adopted out, out in the world as well. So the whole platform comes together as this combination of uh, Kubernetes, etcd, CoreOS Linux. Um, we have our own container runtime called Rocket, which we built primarily to address some security issues in, in Docker. Um, and so all of these pieces come together, and what we call that that piece when they're all together is Tectonic. Tectonic is our product that, that is that Google's infrastructure in a box. Okay, let me just uh, drop down in the weeds for <laughs> yeah. a sec. Um, uh, Derek Collison calls, um, um, he calls, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having a senior moment. You know, <laughs> and I hope it's not early onset Alzheimer's. Um, but um, the, uh, oh, Docker, he calls um, sort of this generation's tarball, you know, like to distribute, you know, just a sort of, I guess the equivalent of an executable. Um, are you providing something that's compatible or does, does the, what's inside the container have to change to take advantage of the additional services, you know, that's sort of Google-centric? Sure. So. The packaging, that tarball piece, we're, we're compatible with, and we'll always remain compatible with. Okay. Um, to even further the compatibility, we've, we've put together standards around what that container should be so many vendors can interoperate you know, more, more widely. Okay. We've done that first through the App Container Project, and then more recently through the Open Container Initiative, which is a joint effort between Docker and, and us and the rest of the ecosystem. Um, and so we'll always, we always want the user to be able to package their application once and then choose whatever system they want to run it in, and the container is what really unlocks that for Okay, so then let me ask you, um, are, does the Google um, Compute Engine folks, um, or, or, the, or the, PASS, the PASS group, do they view you as a way of priming the pump outside the Google ecosystem to get others using their sort of application model or their infrastructure model? Um, or, because um, I'm trying to understand, that you know, Azure sort of has its own way of looking at the world, and you know, Amazon has its own way of looking at the world. Are they s looking at you as a way of sort of disseminating uh, an approach to building applications or, or managing applications? Sure. So the Google team and their motivations behind Kubernetes, you know, you'd have to talk to them about it. My understanding is that that they see that as a way to have a very consistent environment between different cloud providers and so on. It's, it is a you know, next generation way of running infrastructure as well. It is just better than the previous okay, way of running that's infrastructure. that's sort of the answer I was looking and, for, which is that they don't have to either give away their stuff or manage their infrastructure elsewhere, but you're, you're sort of the, um, the channel to deliver Google-style infrastructure 
in other environments. So, I mean, Google Cloud's motivation at the end of the day is selling cores and memory. They put all these other services on top of it to make it, right. um, you know, to make it more um, attractive to use. But at the end of the day, anything that drives more usage of these products is, is how they run their business. At least that's my perception of it. I am obviously not speaking on behalf of Google. So, where are you in attracting, you know, showcase customers, guys who've sort of said, okay, we'll bet. You know, if not the entire business, we'll bet the success of this application or these set of applications on this. Right. So, first, the technology has been very, very exciting. I mean, the past two years we've seen you know this whole space explode in interest. But the discussion around how does this solve business problems, how does this actually get adopted in these companies, and what motivates them to actually do this outside of the tech being very cool, right. that's a discussion that. Uh, is just getting started, and in fact, in about two weeks here in early uh, December in New York, we're hosting that discussion at an event called the Tectonic Summit. The Tectonic Summit is where we're bringing together all the enterprise early adopters that are using containers, yeah. using distributed systems, and talking about like why did why did their management and their leadership you know, decide to make investments in these technologies? And what we're seeing are use cases about you know, multi-data center between your physical data center and your cloud environments. We're seeing folks build their next generation web services. Many businesses that were traditionally in the web services business need to be now because of mobile, just modern product offerings. And so we're, we're hearing we're hearing from these large guys and how they're using our technologies and other companies' technologies today uh, to do this in just two weeks at our event. Would it be fair to say, I'm listening to this, and what, what seems to be coming across is um, that your technology makes it easier to abstract not just the machine, which would be CoreOS, but um, hybrid infrastructure. And it doesn't even have to be hybrid. It could be this data center and that data center. Right. Or your own data center and a public you know, exactly. cloud. That's One of the biggest value props of all this is the consistency between environments. We just give us compute, CPUs, memory, storage. We don't care if it's on cloud or if it's a physical data center. We can allow you to manage that in an extremely consistent way. Okay? Okay. And, and not just between your data centers, but also between development and production. Right. And that, that's a really important part of all of this. Do you need a, a, a point of view built into the infrastructure to make it palatable to developers you know, who want a, a platform as opposed to just infrastructure? Sure, so one of the things that's most exciting about this space is we're splitting the difference of platform and infrastructure. So platform is typically like platform as a service, this very prescriptive way of running your server infrastructure. Yeah. Then there's raw infrastructure, which is a, a like, here is a canvas, go to town, you yeah. need to bring all your own tools. Um, what's happening right now in this distributed systems container space is a, a middle category. It's still infrastructure, but it's application focused. And at the end of the day, that's what a developer is trying to do, is to deploy their application out into the server infrastructure. So, so it doesn't have an opinion that tells the developer, we think you should build it this way, right. but it does hide all the sort of the different types of hardware, you know, and their location, right. and pretty you, much. Right, gives you a prescriptive way to how you package and deploy that. It doesn't put on any constraints of what you can package or deploy. Okay, very interesting. It's sort of like a, if, if platform as a service um, was constraining um, because it, um, I guess because developers didn't want a straitjacket, you know, for how they should build the app, and infrastructure as a service was too raw. Mm -hmm. You're giving them a middle ground. Exactly. This middle. It's still infrastructure. Yeah. But it's a consistent way of running that infrastructure, and that's why companies like Google and Facebook and Twitter do this. They have millions of servers and data centers all over the world, and they can't prescribe. Well, well, they. They need to be able to have a consistent way of doing it so that they don't have to have an infinitely growing operations team as they scale their infrastructure. Right. Right? You need to have consistency, but at the same time, you need to be able to have a wide array of applications and tools and things to deploy and interact with that infrastructure. So it's that middle ground, and that's why the hyperscale guys have adopted it, because they are forced to, because they have to have that consistency to have that scale. Okay, let me ask you then, not on the, um, uh, so separate from the, the hyperscale guys, um, there, you know, the sort of newest distributed system that mainstream enterprises are struggling with and sort of off the record maybe choking on, you know, is Hadoop. Because, you know, they haven't had to do elastic infrastructure before. And, right. you know, like you said, the Zookeeper is, you know, not that easy. And there's 22 other projects, by, you know, by the way, that also have to get, you know, stood up. Um, how, can you help someone who's perhaps flailing in that, or if not flailing, 
finding the skills overhead really, really tough. Right. So Hadoop, let's remember Hadoop's roots. Where did that come from? Well, Yahoo, yeah. Well, but where did Yahoo get the oh, idea? Oh, yeah, Google. <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, Yahoo yeah. gets all the credit for it, even, right, right. Though, even though it was a Google paper okay. that was modeled after it. And so, again, if Kubernetes and containers and everything is the equivalent of um, Google's Borg, which is that raw application infrastructure, yeah. Hadoop is a certain application that consumes the spare resources on that cluster in order to do these map reduce and computational jobs. Right? So, so the, the next question is how much can you simplify what mainstream enterprises do that don't have the Google infrastructure yet. Right, so they have to manage that as its own whole separate thing. It's its own set of infrastructure, its own set of servers to manage their Hadoop cluster. Okay. But if you combine it with this application infrastructure, well, we just treat Hadoop as another application that runs on the, on the platform. It's not its own distinct special thing. It's just another application running out there along with your web, web servers and your databases and everything else. You have your Hadoop workload in the mix. So you have this consistent pool of infrastructure, and Hadoop is just another application that's monitored and managed the exact same way as everything else. So um, for folks who are a little more um, familiar with Mesos, um, which is the opposite of a, a virtual machine. It makes many machines look like a single one. Mm -hmm. I assume, you know, that's... Well, this, this is a very similar message to yeah. Mesos. Mesos is also building Google-like infrastructure for everyone right. else. The difference with what we're doing is really we just partnered up with the team that built that at Google and focusing our solution around Kubernetes, which is what the Google efforts are behind. So we're and all modeling Google's infrastructure. Okay. Okay. Mesos took their own spin on it with Kubernetes and CoreOS and NCD, we're taking a different spin on it. So, and what other products have you built out that we haven't touched on, and what do you see the roadmap looking like? Sure, so really, all these things we've talked about are open source projects. They're all components for building this Google-like infrastructure. Right. Tectonic is our platform for companies that want this style of infrastructure, but they don't want to have to figure out all the different pieces themselves. Okay? And we think once companies adopt Tectonic, just this general style of infrastructure, yeah. that we can give them all the benefits of this, better utilization, the consistency, easier you know, management of lots and lots of servers and so on. But we also think we can dramatically improve the security of their infrastructure as well. And that's where we're investing in our roadmap, is to leverage this kind of change, and then with that change, we can do some things to the infrastructure that was never possible before. Okay. Uh, and that's the things that we're investing in as a company. Okay, great. We're going to break at that. Um, this is George Gilbert um, at Structure 15 with Alex Colby of CoreOS, and we'll be back in just a few minutes.